Hey, Factnatics. If you've seen the latest series of videos, you know I've been taking some of the industry webinars I host and repurposing them so everyone can have access to the great information. Today, we've got a webinar from just after Cedia where I sat down with Anthony Grimani and discussed the award-winning Soundroom 10 demo from the show. This room was voted one of the best demos at the show by multiple groups and featured the latest technology from Grimani Systems, Seymour Screen Excellence, Storm Audio, Row One Seating, Bargo Projectors, Mad VR, and Kaleidoscape. Plus, special thanks to Prolux, who happens to be local to Colorado and was willing to help us out with some last minute LED needs and support. This video goes through the thought process and documentation of the demo room design, giving you a great opportunity to see firsthand what goes into a Gramani theater, as well as a glimpse of the work involved in building a first class Cedia demo theater in just three days. You'll even see a few photos and videos of yours truly hanging panels and speakers in the room, which has got me excited to get my new theater going as well. I'm Brett Bjorquist, head Factnatic, and today we're discussing what goes into an award-winning demo theater. There was obviously a lot of stuff that was covered at Cedia. Bass was obviously a big thing in there. Uh, we had RP22 that kicked off and launched uh, and so thought it would be kind of cool to be able to pull everybody together, get Anthony on the line here. While we are uh, waiting for everybody to finish filtering in here, we're going to play a quick video and then we'll go ahead and get things kind of kicked off. Well, we got pretty much 30 hours. You show up the show and three 10 hour days later, you have to have finished a superlative theater that's going to impress all the people over here who are hard to impress, right? Our task is in three days, we have to build a half million dollar home theater that's, that's not just punching above its weight class. We're gonna impress people who build million dollar theaters for a living. So there are many different challenges. The first challenge obviously is that you're on the show and that's, uh, I mean, you need to do everything in a couple of days. We got a whole crew of people. We had a bunch of speakers, a bunch of amplifiers, a bunch of ceramic rotors, a big projector, a big screen, all this lighting, all this uh, acoustical treatments everywhere. And we got to get it all installed per the plan in 30 hours. It's a lot of work. What you're looking at around this room represents uh, a year of planning, right? But even with a year of planning, there's always the unexpected. I'm most excited to hear the synergy of how these things happen and working with these world-class partners, uh, it's, it's a multiplier when you've got the best audio and the best uh, video and the best uh, uh, seating and the best combination of everything going on. But we have a group of companies that have worked incredibly well together to put, put this, uh, tur turn basically this, this flat piece of nothing 30 hours ago or 25 hours ago into a theater. I'm really excited to see the results that should be finished like in a, in, in a few hours. Um, this would already be a, a very big achievement for, for all of us. And then looking, seeing the, 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 the smile on the face of all the, our reps, uh, dealers and prospects that we we'll see uh, throughout the show will clearly be uh, the biggest success for us uh, for this show. I can't wait until this is all done and we can show it off to all the visitors here. But this year's show, we're going to show the widest material we've ever seen, you've ever seen. We're going to show you the tallest material you've ever seen and everything in between. And you're going to get what this, this, this smorgasbord of, of video options is going to provide. It's going to be fucking great. When you come in this room, you're going to experience something that is revolutionary. It's going to be a great room. It's going to be an incredible room. We believe that there won't ever be a better room a better experience in such a room than what we're building uh, here today. That last statement was a pretty bold statement. That's right, forever and ever, Anthony, forever and ever. That's that's bold, and that's bold because he, here we are, I think that statement, given where the room was, is about a day two of the setup, right? <laughs> and that's what we want to do is we want to we want to put together a uh, a kick butt demo really you don't really know if it's going to kick butt until you fire it up and you run it because there are so many variables a million variables and there's no time and so mm -hmm. when olivier from uh, from storm says this is going to be the best demo ever i'm like I hope so. <laughs> well, fingers crossed. You can't see my toes. My toes are also crossed. And it did turn out to it did turn out very, very well. Uh, thanks to everybody's amazing efforts. 
but uh, I we're going to talk about this. This uh, putting these things together is a uh, is an exercise in no sleep and a lot of wishfulness that it all comes together. No doubt. Uh, Anthony, tell everybody uh, just a quick little bit about your background and uh, what's bringing you in here. My sorted background. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. How far back do I go? I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say that I started I started young and early, uh, and it started. <laughs> way early. My mom was a, a professional opera singer and my dad was an electrical electrical engineer with a passion for audio and video. So it's sort of like, you know, it was, I came out of the womb and it was like injected um, and then studied electrical engineering. And I was lucky enough uh, to get a job at Dolby Labs right out of college, just like fresh fellow. I, um, I did work running a radio station in the Sacramento area for a little while as a chief engineer there. And I got this job at Dolby in the very, very early days of surround sound. Um, and was one of the people in the team that took that thing that was in movie theaters called Dolby Stereo and brought it into the home as Dolby Surround, Dolby Surround Pro Logic, Dolby Digital, et cetera. Uh, after five years of doing that fun st stuff, I got recruited to go work at Lucasfilm to put together the home THX program. So I was there for 10 years, uh, worked on all the early products, the first 10 years of it, got all the licensees lined up. And then um, after 10 years of that, I decided to start my own consulting company that, that designs and follows through construction and calibrates high-end home theaters, recording studios, things like that. So that started 24 years ago called PMI Engineering. Um, and then as an as a uh, offshoot of that, um, started a speaker company called Gramani Systems about five, going on six years ago. It was basically, hey, in designing a room, this is the kind of speaker I would like. Um, and basically uh, uh, our, our wish list for what would be a really cool speaker to put in people's home theaters and our being uh, my chief engineer, Manny Lekaruba and I was like, man, it'd be so cool if somebody made speakers like this and like that and had this feature and that feature. And after a while of asking all the all the manufacturers if they would do it, we just got tired. We just did it ourselves. <laughs> Love it. So here we are today. Beautiful. We don't often get to see kind of the background, right? We saw the 30 hours. That was kind of a fun video, uh, you know, showing a few pieces in there. Uh, but when we really look at the design, I mean, this isn't just a room where we throw some speakers into, put a projector in, and, and hope it works. Um, so, Anthony, I think we really want to dig into sound room 10 a little bit. You know, I, I know obviously you did the design, you've got the drawings, uh, and I know you're willing to, to share a little bit more than what normally gets shared in there. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna let you kind of take it over, but yeah, if we can kind of talk about some of the designs, decisions that were made and, and why they're made. I guess one of the members of the press we were talking to, I forget who it was before the show said, so, you know, what are you gonna do? You're just gonna show up, put up a bunch of speakers and and let it fly, it's like, yeah, no, that's not how it's done. <laughs> and that's not how it should ever be done uh, at a trade show, of course, but it's not, that's not how it should be done in custom integration. There should be a lot of thinking and planning um, well ahead of time so that when you show up, it's a, it's a quick execution. And I'm, I'm proud, you know, even though I said earlier, we're keeping our fingers crossed, I'm proud that all of the really almost year of planning that went into this, um, that it was kind of like an expedition you go climb Everest. You don't just show up at the foot of Everest and and climb. There's a lot of planning. Uh, you got to bring all your gear with you. You got to think about how you're doing, who you're bringing, and that's just how like these shows are. We're we're camping at the top of Everest and hoping that along the way we can cook a really nice meal and give a really good demo. So a lot of planning. Planning is the key. So let me let me show you the result of the planning. I'm going to share screen over here. What was the planning? The planning is. Uh, there was there was four uh, four partners working on on this room. There was it was us providing the sound system and the engineering. Um, there was Storm Audio providing the the surround processing equipment, uh, Screen Excellence providing the the screen display, and Barco loaned us a projector along with some other partners. And there was Row One providing the seating. And we had all these phone calls all the time. Once a week, we would get together and go, "How are we going to do this? How are we going to do this?" And there, along the process, there was a number of different meanders, like all projects should be. One of the meanders actually included building a room completely off-site, putting it on a truck and bringing it in. And at some point, we're like, that is just way too expensive and way too much work. So we resorted back to renting the sound rooms uh, that Cedia has provided for a while. I guess this is the last year they're going to do that. But mm -hmm. um, so we decided we're going to rent the, uh, the sound room. We 
it it took us months to get the exact dimensions of the thing and then when we showed up it was actually different but um this is the plan set we generated after a lot of thinking back and forth a lot of engineering there's a whole there's a whole design spreadsheet that allows us to know like where should the speakers go where do we put the seats etc but we generated this set of plans uh first off is a few renderings of the room um, and uh, as you can see here, there are uh, two rows of four using row one seating. And then uh, what was added at the end is a little row of bar stools at the back. And those of you who may have gone to the demo and ended up coming in towards the end and sat in the back of the room, I hope that's a good demo of why you don't put a couch on the back of the room. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I see architect drawings that show the main row of seating all the way on the back wall. It's like, yeah, you can see the picture, you can hear sound. It ain't great. Uh, so I have to apologize to those who sat in the back and experienced that. Um, but so two two rows of, of main seating um, and then an array of loudspeakers all the way around. Three three front speakers using our Rixos XL, um, a, a pair of wide channel speakers. Those are the first set of sidewall speakers over here to, towards your front, uh, between the front speakers and the side speakers as we normally know them first around. So a pair of wide speakers, one here, and then one you can see down here on the other side, two sets of side speakers to have a better consistency in audio, audience coverage, plus the ability to delay them progressively so the sound field stays the same as you go back in the room. And then a pair of back channel speakers on the back wall facing forward. Um, on the ceiling, we actually had six loudspeakers. I hope you can see them well here. A pair of what we call the, the top ones, a pair of top two and a pair of top three going back. To, to present the, the top part of immersive audio. Now, where things got really, really interesting is the subwoofer in this room was part of what ended up being the base wars in, in this show. Really, really cool. Um, so the way we, we the, the, the armament we brought to the base wars was four corner mounted subwoofers in our line called a Psy. It's a dual 13 and a half inch driver in a cabinet that's not that big. And then two behemoth 21 inch long excursion <laughs> infrasonic subwoofers. Um, so that's what we had. There's other, we're, we're going to get back towards the end of this to talk about bass, but that's what we had for bass. And I got to tell you, officially, I was really worried that essentially the cardboard walls we rented for from the show, the exhibition service, would not contain the bass, that all of this woofage would just go out into the convention center and not stay in the room. I call it cardboard because the walls, the actual, those of you who came in and saw this and it was like, okay, this is pretty cool. The walls were actually quarter inch plywood, quarter inch plywood sandwiched within the middle, an inch and a half of styrofoam. That's it. That's what they gave us. And we're like, oof, that's not going to be very good. Well, it turned out to work quite well in the end. Um, again, the base was strong. The subwoofers were very, very far from their limit. I can actually monitor the voltage on my computer to look at what the amps are doing. And we, we, did, we did really well in terms of base. In fact, I had to turn it down a little bit a few times. So um, now uh, this is what our plant set look, looks like. This is a legend of all of the materials you're about to see. This is a top view of the room with the visual angles. So those of you who sat in the front row, you were looking at a 61 degree subtended view of the screen. The screen is 162 inches wide. By the way, I was talking screen width, not diagonal. Why? The film industry that we're, when you're talking about home cinema, home theater, we're, we're trying to convey or stay within the standards of the film industry as converted into the home. The film industry talks about screen widths because that relates to your visual acuity and what, what you can see, what, what resolution you can see. The TV industry, I'm going to say starting in the late 60s, started to talk about TVs as diagonals to make them sound bigger than they really were. That's the wrong way to describe a screen. Diagonal doesn't make any sense, especially in a world where aspect ratios change all the time. Let's talk about screen width. So we had a screen that was 162 degrees wide by 91.1 high. And with that width and height, the horizontal subtended angle at the front row was 61 degrees and the back row was 42 degrees, which is a, a really nice ideal pairing for two rows of seating, where somewhere in the middle is 50 degrees, which is the target for 4K. And then we have all the dimensions of what's going, to, what's going where, you know, what's, what's being handled. Here's the location of all of the loudspeakers uh, with subtended angles again to the speaker. So at the front row, you're sitting at 47 degrees from the pair of left and right speakers. And at the back row, 
you're looking at over here is 32 degrees, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is all shown and calculated and expressed. And here you can clearly see the top six loudspeakers to, to finish forming that immersive bubble. Immersive audio is not just the top speakers. Atmos is not just the top speakers. Atmos is the whole thing, right? The, the, the circle of sound this way and that way, the whole bubble all the way around you. So these are what I call the top speakers. Now, this is a peel out view of the location of the speakers and the acoustical treatments. And then uh, where you see the top in the middle and then the left wall, the right wall, the top, the, 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 on the top is the front wall, on the bottom is the back wall. And then we're just gonna go into each one of the walls. We always like to start on the left. Um, so this is a layout of what was on, on the left wall with the wide channel speaker, the first side, the second side, all the distances, everything was there. And I'm gonna show you a picture of, of uh, Brett and Trevor actually hanging one of those panels <laughs> after having measured exactly to those dimensions and it all worked out. Um, now what you're seeing around here, this perimeter is what became affectionately known as the belly band. Uh, I think Chris Seymour ended up calling it that. That was the band of fabric at the belly height of the of the room that hid all of this stuff um you could argue hey we're amongst us audio geeks audio video geeks we don't need to hide it it's like well we went we wanted a room that looked good so we we when you walked into this room i'll show you a video of it you walked in this room you didn't see any of this gear it was all hidden behind stretch fabric like it should be in a professionally done home cinema well and i think that's an, an important piece in there anthony because like you said <laughs> i thought it looked pretty darn cool with everything showing, right. <laughs> as do many of us. But obviously, when we're talking about home theater designs, and there's obvious often an architect or a, or a designer, you know, in in the house, they obviously don't want to see it, or even other people in the house sometimes. So, what percentage? I know we've been talking about this a little bit. What percentage of your jobs are using a material that covers up all this kind of stuff, or or how how does that typically get designed for in in one of your theaters, Anthony? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So I, I would say that, you know, somebody said once that 82% of all statistics are made up on the on the spot. And <laughs> that itself is a weird statistic. I, in, in, in the case of our business, and we're a little different to the broad spectrum of the business, I would say that, let's just say that 75% of the things we are involved in are dedicated theaters, which means 25 are multi-use spaces. So a, a, a living room, a dining space, something that is not a dedicated theater. But on, I would say on the dedicated theaters, 90% of them end up with a stretch fabric dress, which, okay. which is one of many different looks. It doesn't, you know, there is no look to it. It can be anything you want. Um, but in, in, in most cases, the speakers, the acoustical treatments, the wiring, um, all of that stuff is hidden behind an acoustically transparent dress. When you walk in the room, you're not looking at a bunch of gear. You're just you're looking at a room that's really interesting and very cool that tells you something special is going to happen here. And uh, it can look classical. It can look modern. It can look space age. It can look whatever whatever your imagination uh, drives you to. You do have to use the right material so that the sound can go through the fabric, uh, which we'll talk about in a second here. Um, but yeah, I would say the majority of the dedicated theaters have hidden gear. Oh, very cool. So, and and again, we won't have time to talk about it today, but you did bring up, you know, in that mixed use media room space, I've seen pictures of some of the jobs that you've done where that is hidden as well in using material. Yeah. So yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll probably have to do, like I said, something more specific about hiding equipment when pe other people don't want to see it. Um, but like I said, that that is cool. And this room turned out really good. I've got a couple quick questions in here. So I want to pick them off a little bit on here, Anthony, and then I'll let you jump back into it. Uh, Matt Blair, good friend. So good to see you, Matt. And I know he went through the booth. He said that something that stood out to him was that the rear surrounds, uh, are more narrow than he normally designs for, but mm. the sound stage was unaffected by them being narrower, uh, mm. or what he thought was narrower placement. Uh, mm. he says it sounded amazing. Is this due to the speaker's inherent dispersion, calibration, a mix of both? What, you know, so as you look at the that, you know, and then I had Keith Rogers again, long term. So thank you. Um, and he was commenting on the wider spacing of the top twos, which I think he means in the in the middle section. So um, can you talk a little bit about spacing and and how these things are kind of put in and 
uh, and and how you make sure that as you're moving those different speakers or perhaps different than somebody else, how does that affect the the sound? Yeah, that's a two hour webinar. I know. Um, <laughs> let's just let's just say this. Um, um, research shows. I always love that. Research shows that th that pair of speakers to make everything work right, and I'll tell you where the research comes from, needs to be some, somewhere uh, such that the subtended angle between them is 30 degrees. That's plus and minus 15. So if this is zero and that's 180, that speaker needs to be at 165 and the other one needs to be at minus 165. If you put them wider than that, the sound field starts to collapse forward or the, or the perception of sound field from the back speakers starts to be too wide. And in some cases through a, a process called psychoacoustic inversion actually starts to sound like it's in front of you. Uh, and that's because the, if you put them wide enough, the pair of speakers is grazing into your eardrums and your brain interprets that or into your ear canal and your eardrum and your brain interprets that as the sound in front of you. That is not the intended intent. Um, we found that early. So I, I worked on the, your early patents for, at the time, what was called uh, Surround EX uh, for a new, kind of a new soundtrack extension format for uh, the, the, you know, the, the Star Wars 1, The Phantom Menace, and designed all the electronics to make all that work, to be able to encode more channels in the back. And in the first test, it wasn't working. And you listen this way, it's like, oh, I can hear it behind me. But when I turn forward, it's like, where's it going? And then realized, oh, if you put them too far apart, which the tendency is to put them like the left and right speakers, but in the back, you get this inversion. So you want them closer to each other so that the sound stage goes from like this to from like way too wide to correctly correlated a sounding behind you. There's other tricks you can also apply to make sure it stays behind there uh, with some signal processing and we can talk about that. But all of you guys who have put a pair of speakers back there and you're like, I don't know, I'm not sure that I hear this thing going around the back. That's probably why. Let's do a webinar just about that. Oh, we can absolutely do a webinar just about that. And that's pretty geeky. We got a few other, you know, things. We'll we'll chat about those a little bit later. So I'm gonna let you get back to it, Anthony. Let's see. So that's the left wall. That's the front wall. This is what was largely hidden by the screen. So the screen perimeter is shown here as this frame. Beam, 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 beam. And behind that, we have a left center and right speaker using our Cedia CE Pro Award winning Rixos XL speakers. Um, so this speaker won an award. It's a new speaker for us. Um, it's very compact. There's a video of me somewhere you know, showing that I'm holding it. I am holding in my hand a speaker that can produce 128 decibels. Wow. It can light up a 200 seat movie theater. Man. I weigh 124 pounds. I can pick it up. That's awesome. Right? We've added lightness. Um, some, some, I'm sure, how long did it take you to engineer the, the speakers? Uh, it's about a four year process. Wow. Well, you did it. You did an excellent job. Okay. I'm running out of steam. <laughs> Wait, there's more. It's also an audiophile speaker. So that's what's really novel about this is here's a speaker that has the dynamics you want for lighting up a theater with, you know, this, but when you turn it down and you're listening to Mahler's fifth in stereo, it actually produces a, a stereo quality and image. It's on par with anything else out there. Um, that's not me. That's actually the genius of our chief engineer, Manny LaCaruba, who is a recording engineer who works and works and works until the sound is just perfect. And that's what the speaker can do, which is why it won an award. Three of those uh, Rixos XL speakers, they're, they're actually driven by a four-way amplifier. Each one of them g gets a 1200 watt amplifier to drive the woofer, the bottom mid, the, the upper mid, and the tweeter separately. Um, and then to the left and right of that pair is two of our size subwoofers, dual 13 and a half, each one driven by about uh, 1500 watts. And then these Mahongas uh, infrasonic subwoofers, 21 inch. Yeah, they're not as big as the whatever, 75 inch. There's a point at which the driver gets so big that it don't play no bass. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Some of you guys that may have come to my lecture on the anatomy of a speaker may have heard this, but you put a really big driver in a cabinet that's not the size of a room, and all that it's doing is looking big. It's not playing very low. Then you have to compensate by putting a whole bunch of amplification. We don't really believe in doing that too much. Anyway, so uh, also what you see here, I forgot, I forgot to mention here, these other blocks of color here, those are acoustical treatments. So on the left wall, we had three absorbers. That's it. Didn't line the whole room with a ton of absorption like some people do, plus a small one on the door. And then these things are scattering devices, also known as diffusers. This one is a hemi disc scattering device that only redirects the sound horizontally. And this is a hemispheric 
scattering device that redirects it as a hemisphere. Um, they're strategically located so that the sound coming off the speakers is redirected in the room as a really even crescent of sound energy. So that's on the front. On the front, these four panels over here were, th were there uh, serving as a base absorber, mid-base absorber for the sound radiating around the back of the speakers. Right wall looks kind of like the left wall, except that it's, it's asymmetrically offset. More on that later. That's what actually has turned out to sound better, not, exact, not have the exact same thing on both walls, but the slight, slight dissymmetry. Um, but here's four absorbers, some diffusers, and then our wide channel speaker, first side speaker, second side speaker. We call this the SR1, and this is SR2. Um, and then here you can s see the heads of our sitting man, we call them. And then finally, the back wall. Here's that pair of back speakers somebody talked about. Pretty close together. Um, typically around four or five feet away from each other, center to center. That's it. Um, uh, you can also see the extra pair of subwoofers sitting back here. May, those of you who walked in the room may have noticed them sitting down there. Um, and then finally, the ceiling. Oop, let me go back. Ceiling has top one pair, top two pair, and top three pair all using our Rixos WD+, Plus, our, our bigger ceiling speaker, uh, hanging from the ceiling through the screws that went all the way through into a three-quarter inch backer plate with long, heavy gauge screws, because we didn't want those falling on anybody's head. Um, and uh, we're sort of laughing about this, because that's that was like at three o'clock in the morning, you know, we're like driving through there, persons in the front holding down the, uh, the plate, trying to make sure that the screw didn't end up in their kneecap. That's right. Um, I think oh, there was a uh, actually a pretty cool video of that where it was pretty close to Chris Seymour at one point yeah, while he's pushing yeah. down the plate and the yeah. screws coming up. Oh, um, also yeah. treatments treatments on the ceiling. So some some absorbers in the that first reflection area we really want to control that, um, and then diffusers on the rest of it so that the sound field from all the surrounds and stuff can actually integrate through a scattered sound return, not a solid, not a what's called a specular bounce, but a scattered sound return. Now, and then, finally, Anthony, sorry, real quick in there. Yeah. So Craig was asking, I got two questions in there I want to hit while you're right in this area. So Craig was asking, how thick are the uh, are, are the absorbers that you have, the blue ones on this case in the ceiling, uh, the the uh, the wall ones as, as well? Yep. All of the absorbers except the one on the door were all four inch thick of a upper mid density uh, glass fiber with with a scrim in front of it. Long story around that. Uh, but yeah, four, typically four inches thick. Okay. On rooms, if we have the room, we like to put four inch thick panels on two by four rails to give them a little bit of an air gap. Uh, but uh, on this one, the room, room was a little too tight, so we stuck with four inches. And my microphone is wanting to fall down, of course. <laughs> and so, and, and Anthony, we won't have a whole lot of time to, to talk deeply into it, but four inches, obviously we see a lot of people drop in, you know, one inch panels, maybe two inch panels. Uh, yep. Hey, I'm gonna hold on one second. Keep keep talking. Not I gotta, a problem. So I, I gotta I gotta deal with something over here. <laughs> well, he figures that out. So, uh, you guys, when a lot of times we see one inch panels, two inch panels. Uh, in this case, we're talking about four inch panels. Uh, the reality is that one inch panels do not stop bass. Uh, even four inch panels aren't gonna stop it well enough. Um, but you know, as we look at the room, we're obviously trying to uh, be able to absorb and as much as we can control the base that's in the room. And so that's why we go with four inch panels. Uh, as Anthony was mentioning, uh, typically if you're looking at room acoustics, if you can take a panel of any size, so let's say you can only get two inch panels in there. Uh, if you prop them off the wall, two inches. Uh, you get an added benefit of almost being like four inch panels. So something to think about uh, as you look in there, basically as the, the sound is going through, hitting the wall and coming back, uh, it's getting absorbed on both directions. So, uh, so like I said, those are four inch absorbers. The other question that was in there, Anthony, uh, is from Zach. Uh, so he was saying for the front wide, were they angled at all? Uh, they obviously look fairly off access from the from the seating. So how does how, how effective is that, and how how does that work in a design like this, Anthony? That's a really interesting thing. So um, uh, by the way, on the panels, a, a four inch thick panel of a, of good absorption works down to two hundred and fifty hertz, which isn't really even bass. That's that's no. like 
that's the lower mids. And that's really what you want to be able to do in controlling a sound reflection. As you go thinner, the cutoff frequency of it goes up in frequency and it just you start to miss some of the control of, of the, uh, the energy. Now, about the wide channels and where they're not, why they're not angled. Check it out. We, we make speakers that actually have a coverage all the way out to 70 degrees. So whether you listen on axis, go out to 30 degrees, 60 degrees, go all the way out to 70 degrees, there's virtually no change. So when you're sitting uh, over here, uh, let me actually go back to this diagram so maybe you can see it. When, when you're sitting all the way over here and you look at that angle, that is 36 degrees off axis of that speaker. Um, whether you whether you aim that speaker in or not, it's going to sound exactly the same. It's sort of like if you had a light bulb, you turn it this way, that way, it, its light doesn't change. That's particular to our range of speakers with their intended wide and constant directivity. If you had a more traditional speaker with a hotspot in front, you would absolutely need to aim it in. Otherwise, you're listening to this. That won't work. Um, so that was one question. I'm sorry, Brett. Was there something else there? Somebody no, I, I think we were mainly talking about off axis in there. Mm -hmm. We're talking about acoustics on the front wall. So obviously, I've seen plenty of pictures of people putting absorption across the entire front wall, right? Trying to, to, to stop any of that. Obviously, here we have panels that are on the front wall. What are your thoughts on, uh, you know, front wall absorption? Uh, as it pertains to the room. It is a good idea on the front wall to put absorption. It is a bad, in my view, it's a bad idea to put diffusion. There's nothing there to diffuse. It's all low frequency energy flowing from, you know, behind the speaker and a diffuser there's, you could put one there, but it's just looking pretty. And I see that a lot in recording studio pictures and um, on, on in forums, I see people putting a, a piece of art also known as a diffuser in the front. It's, it's, <laughs> it's kind of like, what's that doing there? You do want to control the energy in the front, uh, and and the, most of the energy is base and mid base. So if you put a two inch thick panel, it's not doing anything there other than absorbing the front to back reflection. So in general, it is a good idea to control this reflection. So the speakers are going out to you, bouncing off the back wall, coming back, going back and forth. Putting something in the middle of the front wall is a good idea. If that thing can be thicker and maybe mainly be there to absorb base by its design, there's a bunch of people who make uh, uh, absorber panels. Let's not call them base traps. Let's just call them ba you know, base uh, emphasized absorbers. It's a good idea. You don't have to line the whole wall. You just need enough there to take up the, the, low, the mid base of the speaker. Uh, if it's too small, it won't do it. So, so what we had here is four panels of two foot by four foot, 60 by 120 centimeters. And that worked well, a, a chunk about that big. Let me actually go to that drawing. Ding, 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 right here. This, this over here is enough surface to control the base waves. With a little bit more time and energy, I may have wanted to put another pair. Uh, there was just no room to do that. That's, uh, that would be ideal, but that's, that's good enough as it is here. Cool. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Um, so let's see. The other thing we did is to prepare a circuit diagram so that everybody knew what was getting hooked up everywhere. Uh, you know, I, I know what's going to get connected, but we had a team of people working here, which is typical of an integration project. You want to be able to hand a wiring tech and a finished tech, you know, the, the, the data. So here's all the diagrams that show here, here's this amplifier, here's its serial number. It's not shown on here on the, on the next version, but here's the serial number. Here's the connections. Here's all the wires and just go do it. And I'm really proud to say that at the end of all of this, uh, hooked it all up, fired it up and it worked. There was no need for, oh, whoops, I connected this to the wrong place. Oh my God, everything worked because just diligently following the drawings and checking off on it just meant that we didn't have to do any any redos, um, which, which is really cool. That's the way it should be done. I go to hundreds and hundreds of these things, of these rooms in, in actual integration and find that they're not hooked up correctly. And it's traced down to too many connection points, but also documentation that's not clear. Finally, we did a rack layout that said, you know, this is this is what's getting installed uh, front and back, which hopefully you guys are that are doing integration, you all do that. <clears throat> Want to point out that this is the extent of, of this rack for this very potent theater. So in the olden days, this, this theater would have been two full racks, two full height racks, full of gear. Surround processors, video processors, audio processors, amplification, this thing, that thing. And instead we've crunched that down to about 20 U high, I would say from, from top to bottom. Um, all of that is just modern technology. 
So this particular room, uh, one of the big points of technology we did here is the, is the fact that the audio coming off the surround decoder was fed digitally to the amplifiers, um, not with analog connections. Uh, this is this is a back view of the Storm Evo processor. It has seven HDMI inputs and also a pair of analog inputs, and then. This is where you would normally see a whole bunch of either XLR, RCA, or barrier strip analog outs. None of that here. All the audio came out through a CAT6 cable that went into a network switch, a single network. On this drawing, there's actually two. We just used a single network switch and was distributed to all of the amplifiers through CAT6 cables. And somewhere later, I have some pictures of that. So that was a really novel thing. This is what people in professional audio and commercial audio have been doing for a while. And we're introducing that into the residential space as, as what we think is the right way to do it, to simplify connections, improve reliability, improve sound quality, and just make your life easier. Um, so that was, that, was the, that was the result of planning. Um, what do you think of all that, Brett? That is pretty impressive. Cool. So, <laughs> so I'm answering questions as we go in here as well. Everybody's been super engaging. So sounds uh, great. Now, what I want to what I want to do next, if it's okay, you let me know, um, is actually uh, go through a very quick uh, slideshow of of putting the show to uh, putting this show together. Yeah, absolutely. All the so we're going to try to keep it into a couple minutes here, Anthony, because yep. uh, I know we really still topics and really fast. So through the time, but the pictures are great. So definitely so, want to definitely want to see them. So this is two out of the three crates worth of, of materials. We we you know I talked about an expedition up Everest. So we took all the stuff and all jammed it all into these crates, and then went over to the room, and the room started to get built. This is the inside of the room before we do anything to it. It's basically these thin walls carpeted on in the inside with this little industrial grade thin carpet. And here we see Evan Zerby from Screen Excellence standing on a ladder, starting to build the belly band framing. The belly band, uh, that whole system was made out of a backer of aluminum, some kicker uh, plates, and then a front section of aluminum that held the fabric. Um, here it is. In case you ever thought that, that all that Brett does is sit and do webinars. No, he actually works. Look at him. He's, it looks like he's almost sweating here. That's um, right. Hey, I, I recall hanging a lot of stuff and, <laughs> and um, being in that room until about 3 a.m. the morning of the show, right. but absolutely. <laughs> so that's the inside of the room. The, the belly band framing is all going in. Uh, there's Evan Zerby, who is not a light guy, right? This, I, I hesitate to put out any weights, but he weighs. You know, you can sort of see there's a bit of a belly band around him standing on the framing of his belly band, secured over to the wall and going... See, it's strong. Um, there's uh, this is Chris Seymour standing up on the ladder, getting ready to to decide where he's going to put the port glass. This is the belly band framing ready after we actually put some tape to to uh, set up all of the elevations for the acoustic treatments. And here he is, Trevor Rooney and Brett Bjorkwist working away after the framing for this belly band got installed, uh, putting up in this case an absorber panel. Um, and actually, Brett's holding a speaker that's going to get shot into the wall, too. Um, I spend this time talking about the belly band because this is a pretty common type of construction that a stretch fabric wall is going to have. It may not be made out of aluminum profile. Usually, it's it's wood framing. But that's what it is. It's a box that's mounted onto the wall of lightweight framing that, that ends up furring out the fabric in front of the absorbers, diffusers, speakers, and wires. This is a, a, a stitched together view of the back half of the room after the belly band is installed, after all of the speakers are installed, after the projection port glass is put in, some of the speakers. But this gives you a pictorial of what you saw in the plan set. Hopefully it looks just the same, right? Um, and then a quick round of what uh, whoop, that's on that's in the wrong place. A quick round of what the um, you know, what the mid construction looks like. Uh, and yes, it does look like any other installation project with a bunch of stuff laying around everywhere as we're building. Um, and, and there it is. And there's a picture of uh, Travis looking at the screen as it's getting installed. So that's a, that's a view of the back half of the room. And that's me going, 
Okay, we're done with this phase. Fantastic. Now, uh, so here we are. The, the framing is up. Speakers are up. They get wired. Um, and it's time to hang the belly band fabric. So we got some fabric custom printed uh, by a dye sublimation printer. And, um, and then it gets tucked in to, uh, to materials that are usually specifically made for this kind of stretch fabric install. This, this upholstery fabric business is not new. It's been around for years and years and years and years and years for lots of applications. And it's done here. And in this case, interestingly enough, Screen Excellence use, used some of their own uh, uh, profile that they use for screens when they're tucking screens together uh, to stretch the belly band. And here's Chris installing it with this little funny tool that looks like a curved spatula as you push, tuck the thing, in, thing into this little groove that holds the fabric. Um, okay, and and then we get done. And there's a lot of work that goes, you know, following all of that. But then here's the here's what happens in the end. So this is a picture of the outside of the room on a typical day at Cedia Expo. There's a line. Um, and Trevor's job was to keep these people from starting a revolution, uh, starting a, you know, a, a, a riot from having to wait to go in there. And he sat out there explaining to people, you're going to hear this, you're going to hear that. And he was waving his hands. And I just, I just love watching that. Thank you, Trevor. You're um, welcome. So uh, these are videos. So at the, I'll, I'll get back to the videos. At the end of this, we AVS forum came by, they listened to the room and they go, your room sounds great. Here's an award for a best of CEDIA uh, acknowledgement. Very proud of that because it's not just a rubber stamp. They actually sat and listened and chatted with them. It's like, what you guys are doing is great. There's a video of that somewhere. Brett, maybe you can send the links to that. All right. Before we finish, this is an important little piece. This is what was driving the room. This is the actual rack going through construction. Um, and this is a picture of Matthew Pose who came out to help us um, along his other uh, duties at the show. He, he was helping us uh, wire all this together. And uh, this is the simplicity of it. Bef you know, before it all got wired somewhere, we have a picture of it. But it, it ended up just, you know, imagine this with just a few extra wires. And that was it. Very, very clean. There's a picture of Matthew and me um, in front of the booth. Um, and this is what I wanted to show. So this is what a traditional connection plate in the back of a high channel count surround processor would look like. This is a Storm ISP Elite Mark III 32, uh, fully loaded with 32 XLRs. And for those of you who are integrators would know, every one of those ports is going to get an XLR cable that's got to get installed and dressed and, and stripped and connected here and there and here and there. It's balanced line. You got to make sure that the grounds are all good. You got to make sure you do it all right. Well, that all gets replaced by this. This is the new world. And I call this the new world because in the future, which is now, we're we're going to stop doing this. This is this is a pain. Uh, this is way straightforward, way simpler. One Cat6 cable comes out of this thing into a network switch, gets assigned to every amplifier. You go into a little control module that's in the case of the storm. There's a built-in control module that goes, the left channel goes to that amplifier. The center channel goes to this amplifier's channel four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's sort of a virtual matrix. Um, this particular product can also take an, an audio over IP input. And where would that come from? If, if any of you guys are, are doing what's called DCI rooms, which is film industry guys, the output from the Dolby server that has the film on it is an AES67 audio over IP scheme. And it plugs right in there, it's received. And then you go, well, okay, now I'm watching a movie off a digital uh, server. Um, we uh, we actually advertised that we were doing this. Here's a picture of the uh, of the ads on page three, right, Brett of the show dailies. I see a question from Craig Todd. Shout out to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I hope it's okay to say chief scientist at Dolby Labs. He asked, "What was the power draw? Amps at 120 volt? Do you remember that?" Uh, yeah, I, yeah, and I and. It was. Uh, That's a funny story. It, um, it is. So I, I, I was going to push it to the end, but go ahead and, uh, and, and bring it up, Anthony. So there were two things. One, we dropped a, a 240, basically, uh, power drop to make sure that we had enough power 
Uh, but there was something funny in that as well. So why don't you give me, I mean, you got, you got one minute, Anthony, but go so for what, it. So what was funny is it was like an act of God to get a separate 240 volt line. <laughs> I, I wanted to put all the subwoofers on, onto a 30 amp 240 volt line so that we had voltage swing and plenty of current and not step on everything else. And it was like an act of God. And it was like going around and around and around and around. And finally, all the way at the end, we finally get that power drop from the show electricians. And we had fired up the whole room and calibrated all on a single 20 amp circuit for all the audio and did not get around to switching the subwoofer amps to the 240 volt line because the show started. So we did the whole show at pretty loud levels on one 20 amp circuit uh, driving all of these amps. So like, what was it? About 17,000 watts of amplification. Yeah. But that um, now that sounds completely crazy. How do you get there from here? Well, it's a longer story. That would be a good webinar, but I'm just going to say very efficient amplifiers, very efficient speakers. The characteristics of class D plus amplifiers allow us to do all of that, including these subwoofers that are, that are just putting out huge amounts of power on a single 20, 20 amp circuit. And I was like, how did this not blow? Um, I, I would say on average, we were probably using at at most 1,000 to 1,200 watts out of that 20 amp line. Um, and there it is. That's kind of crazy. Yep. And then, uh, Anthony, you were talking about running the subs. So one of the benefits of, mm -hmm. of you know, having an active sub and, and your products in particular is that you can see live how much you're drawing. Right. Yeah. And so that was actually an interesting one. So I'm going to have you, uh, you know, kind of follow up into that one with Craig of, you know, how much. So obviously that room sounded great. Tons of bass. Um, how, how much were you using? How much energy of that and amperage was being used towards uh, for your amplifiers? Right. Uh, so that's a very cool thing about the the uh, the whole amplification system we use in our speakers is all IP controlled and IP monitorable. It's very modern. It's basically bringing into the speaker business what's been going on everywhere else. That's why I say sometimes these are speakers for the 21st century. Everything else is stuck in the last century. Um, and so we actually can monitor uh, the the voltage and current and power on on any on anything we're driving just by by pointing at it and. Uh, I am going to share screen real quick here. I have actually queued up RP22, but I'm also going to bring up uh, very quickly a control panel for what's going on in our office right now. So there's no demos going on. This is the left and right speakers. Uh, can you confirm that you can see yes, this? Yes, we can yeah. see it. Um, so this is this is the the computerized digital signal processing control interface of the amplifiers. And you know, inside it's all DSP circuitry and and software going on, but um, it's all laid out to look kind of like ma like manual for us older guys that were used to amplifiers and different EQs. And this is the room EQ, et cetera, et cetera. But I can actually monitor the voltage going on at the tweeter. In this case, this is a tweeter and woofer system, but um, I can look at the voltages. I can look at the voltages on the subwoofers. Uh, let's see, where's our subs over here? Blue room subs. Um, Right now there's nothing going on so it's at zero but i can at any moment and there was a few guys in the room i showed and look at the voltages and the subwoofers that are in there can all take between 60 volts and 120 volts because they're just high powered things and the things were barely running at 20 to 30 volts like just not idling but but running at a very very conservative level and that's important it's important because you as the integrators you want to make sure that your clients are not pushing this stuff close to red line red line means means actual damage, means means having to do truck rolls to fix things. And what we design is usually very conservative in terms of headroom and certainly at the show was running very conservatively. Cool, tremendous. All right. Obviously at the show, <laughs> bass was front and center, which I know is a, uh, a, a topic near and dear to your heart. Yeah. Uh, we had a few different things. Trinov booth was obviously huge and amazing. Uh, they were showing waveforming. Uh, we had double bass arrays by people. Um, we had what we were kind of joking around with as quad bass because we typically use in the four corners. But um, Anthony, can we talk a little bit in here? And again, we'll probably, this is a huge topic, so we'll probably make it its own webinar. Um, but can we talk a little bit about what was in the CDA rooms and how, how do you choose? If I'm an integrator yeah. designing a system, how do I choose what I need to put into, into a particular build? Bass is fundamental. If the bass doesn't work right in the room, everything else is just falls flat. And bass is one of the hardest things to get right if you don't pay attention to it. So watching everybody got coming essentially to this party going, we're going to worry about bass. 
some somebody like Trinov has their way of doing it called waveforming. Cool. It's their approach. They put a whole bunch of subwoofers in the front, a bunch of subwoofers in the back, do a bunch of analysis and do essentially some some cross cancellation algorithms to reduce the standing wave. Standing wave being the resonance that happens that causes those nulls. So that's one approach. The the Dirac process that is in the storm audio and other processors that that's called ART does it in a different way. It's a, it's a different algorithm. Same concept though is to is to use the different drivers to contradict the base waves that otherwise want to build this really nasty resonance in the room. Very cool. Um, and then our our approach on top of that is to make sure to start off with a good placement to get everything in your favor. So we we still like four subwoofers in the four corners. Uh, to play from pretty much 80 or 90 hertz down to about 40 hertz, where the main standing waves are. And then you you tune those four subwoofers with variable level, delay, and EQ until the, the bass is optimized in the middle of the room. The concept is to get to a point where the energy in the middle, in the seating area, is the most consistent. And, the, and yes, the loudest, the most efficient, but also the most consistent with less errors. Um, and then in the case of Sound Room 10, we overlaid uh, an analysis of ART on top of that to smooth out the final little edges, and it worked great. So in the end, the bass in our room was very consistent from seat to seat, nice and punchy all the way down. Now, what we practice in our room is a variant on this four subwoofer thing I've been lecturing forever, which is take four subwoofers, play them from about 80 or 90 hertz down to where there's no more standing waves, typically 30 to 40 hertz, and then the bottom octave from 15 to 30 play with however many drivers it takes of infrasonic subwoofers, in the case of our room, two in the front, to carry the, bo the bottom. Once you're below the resonance frequencies of the room, you don't need this four subwoofer arrangement because the room is no longer modal, it's called, or resonance. So that's what we did there, and it worked great. When we're adding four subs, and you were talking about this a bit, but just so everybody understands, when you're talking about one sweet spot and two channel, you're not really worried. You're worried about where I'm sitting, right? But when you start putting in eight seats, 12 seats, 15 seats, <laughs> um, you can end up having a you know 20 to 30 dB plus difference between the bass that I'm hearing in one seat and the bass that I'm hearing in another seat. And that's really what we're trying to to fix in all these solutions, right? Is making it so that I don't think it sounds great in my captain's chair. However, the guy next to me or, you know, one row back, uh, you know, isn't hearing any bass at all or is hearing too much and it becomes muddy. Uh, Gary was asking what tests. So we won't go through necessarily all of them. Again, we let's do a calibration webinar. Um, so we can deep dive into stuff for people, but you are a big pink noise fan. Right. And and so I think that's an important piece though of what people are listening to. Uh, so can you talk about that really, really quick while I queue up the next question? Yeah. So there, so me measurements are uh, actually, so there is going to be a recommended standard for measurements, RP34, I think, if I remember the correctly, correctly stated name, I'm going to be part of that. So pink noise, regular pink noise is old school. It's been around for a long time, but a great listening test. What I like to do when I'm all done with the test instruments doing all kinds of interesting non pink noise things I'll get to in a second is I put it all down and I listen to pink noise going left center right side right back. Or you know back right back left just going around the room the tops all of the channels and make sure they sound like the same level in the same spectrum. And your ear brain's going to tell you errors of one or two dB right away that that a microphone system may not be able to reveal. Ultimately, it's what it sounds like to the ear brain, which takes into account the direct field of the speakers and also the reflected field around the room. That all gets integrated correctly. And my ear brain is going to be the same as Brett's and the same as Trevor's. I've verified this hundreds of times. I know we all have different ears, but the way we perceive a room is all very similar. So you go left, center, right, and the center sounds a little bit like this. Everybody's going to go, yeah, the center sounds a little nasally compared to left and right. Now what? Well, once you figure out that it sounds nasally and you look at the response and they look absolutely identical, you owe your, you have the right to go grab a band of EQ, maybe around two and a half or three kilohertz an octave wide, and just depress it one, one and a half dB. That nasiness may go away. And that's what you should do for your clients. I equate this to cooking a fine meal, but before you serve it, you know, you take a taste and you go, ooh, needs a little more salt or a little more pepper or a little more paprika, something that you're putting in there so that it tastes good, so that the client 
when you're, you know, if you're a chef, the client sits there and goes, oh, I love it. This is great. But wait, there's more. If you just delay it based on distance, if you just measure the distances and you go, well, this one is 1.13 feet closer. I'm going to delay it by one point by one millisecond. That may not work out because there's also phase relationships, things in the time domain between that speaker, the acoustics and that speaker. So what I like to do is first delay it based on distance and then listen. And the listening test is this. You, if you're trying to decide, let's see, for you guys, this would be the left, it's my right. You're trying to decide how much delay you're putting to the side left speaker. I like to play pink noise on the left speaker and the side left speaker at the same time, and then adjust the delay there until the phantom image lands right between the two. And the, the theoretical it, uh, distance is a good start, but you usually find that changes of 0.1 millisecond at a time move that image to where the phantom is right where it needs to be. And that phantom being right, right where it needs to be means that the mixer, as they're moving a sound around the room, the mixer being Good the person look. mixing the sound, actually now, now has a nice continuous sound space. And that's done by listening. And then somebody in this forum is gonna go, well, you're hearing it one way, I'm not gonna hear it that way. It's like, much to my surprise, I've like done these adjustments and I go, you come over here, sit down here, and then I, I also, this is kind of like setting the focus on a lens. I go back and forth and I go point to where you hear the sound and they end up imaging the phantom at exactly the same place as I do. And it doesn't make sense because my head, my ear, all of that is totally different than Brett's ear. Uh, I'm pointing to where he is on my screen. <laughs> but our built-in fuzzy logic that's correlating what we're seeing to what we're hearing is built a program in our brain that goes, well, if it's over there, it's over there. So we, we all tend to, Im, uh, image spatially very very similarly and you got to do that test by ear when everything is all done after you equalized all the speakers so that they all sound like they're the same playing pink noise and they all measure the same with impulse response and and pseudo random uh pink noise and then you do that final little thing that final little tweak is what makes the entire acoustic bubble come together from a space you know and and spl uh you know kind of standpoint what would you look at for the ideal room size? Obviously, it depends on how many seats he wants in the theater as well, right? If he sure. wants a couple people or if he's trying to entertain 10. I wouldn't try to do a room that's much longer than 20 feet by 20 by 17 uh, by 9 or so. I wouldn't try to do anything much bigger than that because you get to a point where as you make the room bigger, you need bigger speakers, bigger amps, and everything starts to go up in price um, as you go in square footage, the volume goes up to the cube and everything just starts exponentially going up in price. Sure, so even as you look at things like video with the projector, your lumen output requirements, if now you're 30 feet back, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and super wide and assumably putting a wider screen. So right. no, that, that so makes perfect pro sense. Projectors is a great point of that. If you do a room that's 30 or 32 feet long, you need a screen that's about 170 to 180 inches wide to, you know, to get the coverage of 4K sure. video. And now you need a 5,000 lumen projector to light it up properly with HDR. And right around three to 3,500, um, I was gonna say RPM, three yeah. to 3,500 <laughs> lumens, there's like this inflection point where yeah. suddenly things gets crazy expensive because the volume of those products in terms of manufacturing sales goes down. So we have cleared through all the questions. Thank you, Anthony. Right. Our goal here is always that we can answer all the questions there. Right. Uh, and that's a lot of what I like to do. And obviously, Anthony is the guy to be able to do that. I will hmm. say that for, for Germani Systems, um, our business model is one of help. We're here to help you guys yeah. uh, put together amazing rooms. We're helping you by giving you these packages. There's a Cinema 1, Cinema 2, Cinema 3, Cinema 4, and then a ceiling cinema for different room sizes and applications that helps you right away figure out, based on the room size, Here's what the system should be and here's what the budget should be without having to do a whole bunch of calculations. And then if you want to explore that further, you know, call Trevor, email him, go, I've got a room I'm working on. It's about this size. I've got about this budget. Here's the use case. What should I do? And, you know, without any, uh, with no strings attached, he's going to go, well, we recommend doing this. If you want to go further, get me more data, answer this questionnaire. Um, and we'll, we'll get you real data. Thank you to everybody for hanging on for so long. Anthony, thank you for the two hour webinar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but there was tons of great questions and those are the best things out there, right? It's right. not just a, a static presentation that you time. Uh, it's really being able to answer everybody. 
thank you guys. This was a lot of fun. Uh, Absolutely. And I can't wait to do another one of these. Thanks again, you guys, for all the uh, uh, help and questions and time, Anthony and Trevor. And thank you to everybody that uh, that attended and especially all of those that hung on till the end.